tonight, 1035, Bacara Anoi Guad 13. Remain this frequency, continue taxi gate 12. Remain this frequency. A scenario that almost every airline pilot prepares for when they go in for an interview is what would you do if, while you're sitting there on the flight deck as a brand new first officer, the captain shows up and he is totally drunk? There are a lot of right answers, but since some people have lost common sense, the right answer is not, I'd let the captain sleep it off while I fly the plane like I stole it. Although if you said that to me and I was doing the interviews, I would probably hire you because I thought you were funny and that probably explains why the airline that I work for has never hired me to go to any recruiting events. Now, I'm sure it has happened in the past that an air traffic controller has shown up to work and they've been drunk or inebriated or maybe still hungover or too sick to work, whatever it is, they've showed up there and because there's a team of people generally that are there in the tower or in the office that they're doing some of their work in, somebody would say, no, bro, go home. I'm sure that's happened, but this is a unique situation. Now, I don't know exactly what's happening with this controller, but it takes place here in Quito, Ecuador. Quito is a very high elevation airport and a lot of it is surrounded by mountains. Generally, when you come into land, you land on runway 36. And so when you come in around these mountains, you have a very specific speed restriction that you have to meet and everything has to be done right. Because as far as I know, a plane has never won the battle against a mountain. Now, I have flown into Quito a lot of times. I'm actually supposed to go there later this month. And the controllers there are generally really good. I don't know exactly what's going on with this controller. There's several hours of audio. I pulled out just a couple of key clips because one of the scenarios that happens as a pilot is that you, you prep when you talk about, hey, in this scenario, I'm gonna do this. And in this scenario, I'm gonna do that. One that I've never considered is, what do you do when a controller is up there what sounds like by themselves, unchecked, and they don't sound like they're doing too well. Listen to this audio. Delta 632, taxi. Delta 1, 0 degrees, still fighting as runway 36, leave for takeoff. Ground Delta 632 is ready for taxi. That's correct, 1, 2, 0 degrees, still fighting out. Keto Tower Delta 632 is ready to attack. American 473 10, on the localizer. Delta 632 036 uh, 05 runway 36, leave for takeoff. Keto Tower American 473 uh, ILF 036. Contact Keto Round 1 to 1 to If you're listening to this audio and thinking, this doesn't make any sense, did Kelsey just take a bunch of clips and randomly string them together? No, that's not what's happening. This is the audio as it was sent to me. So let me explain what's going on here. What it sounds like is you have Delta here and they just pushed back. They're on the ground and they're waiting for clearance to taxi to runway 36. And the reason I always refer to 36 is because that's the runway they almost always use that other direction, 1-8, taking off directly into the mountains, and, and that's usually never an ideal strategy. So you have Delta waiting here, we're waiting for instructions on how to get to the runway, and then you also have out here, trying to land, American. And they're at 10,500 feet. American 473, 10,500 on the localizer. And you're thinking, okay, cool, 10,500 feet, they have a lot of time, a long time to go before they get anywhere near the ground. But here's the thing to remember. You'll notice here on this approach plate that 10,500 feet puts them roughly 2,500 feet above the ground and about seven miles away from landing. Now, if you're the Delta plane sitting on the ground, you're hearing this controller talking about someone being cleared for takeoff. You're probably hearing the American trying to come in and land and you're thinking, okay, well, it's not a big deal. We're, we're sitting here, we're not moving, no big deal. If you're the American plane, you're coming in to land, you're hearing, hey, somebody's getting cleared for takeoff. You can't really tell who's getting cleared for takeoff because there's no call sign. And then you're thinking, I don't see anybody there because at 10,500 or 2,500 feet from the runway, you're seven miles out. You at that point should be able to see the runway and see if there's another plane on there and you're hearing so-and-so's cleared for takeoff and you're looking out there and not seeing that. So you're 
a little bit confused what's happening, what's going on, and you need a clearance in order to get down and land the plane. You can't just, okay, well, he's, I don't know, having a problem, so I'm just going to land it anyways. That's not how it works. You have to get a clearance before you land. So listen what happens next. Continue LS approach on 36, wind 0, 0 degrees, 0, 4 knots, clean 8 to 0, 3, 4 inches, report on shore final, runway 36. Okay, quick land runway 36 and 3034 American 473. Special call equipment around, go ahead. The controller tells this American pilot, report short final, and the American pilot reads back, cleared to land. Report on short final, runway 36. Okay, quick land runway 36. That's not a common thing. In general aviation, you will report short final because your plane's moving very slow, but with airlines, it's very clear. You're typically going to be at this rough speed, so they know if you're going to be able to land or not, and so they generally will tell you you're clear to land or continue. Those are usually the two things. Short final, I mean, it can be interpreted a lot of different ways how far that is, but this pilot is probably at this point roughly five miles out from the runway, so he's already kind of there. They're already kind of short final to land on that runway, so getting told report short final doesn't really make sense. The pilot reading back cleared to land, and the controller then jumping over to talk to Delta and not catching that he said report short final and that the, that the pilot read back clear to land, what that does is it creates kind of a weird situation. The pilot technically can land, even though he wasn't cleared to land, he could land and then make the argument, hey, I heard cleared to land and so that's what I read back, and since that didn't get checked, then I understood that we were cleared to land. That, I guess, would be an argument that a pilot could make in that situation. However, that doesn't really work if you end up hitting another plane or there's a problem, right? But him saying we're cleared to land in some ways works out to their advantage because obviously this controller is struggling with something. I don't know. It could be blood sugar. It could be, it could be a million different things. I'm not a doctor. Either way, this controller struggling. If that controller had said report short final and they had done that, they had reported, let's say, three miles out. So now they're, let's say, less than a minute from landing. If they had done that and the controller operating at, let's say, an impaired slower speed didn't give them the clearance to land in time, they would have had to do a go around. By them saying we're cleared to land, even though they weren't, they kind of have a card to play if something were to go wrong and they were to get violated for being landing without a landing clearance. But instead of the controller catching it, the controller directs their attention back to this Delta plane, which is just asking to taxi to the runway. So they're really low on the priority list. Okay, now this went on for several hours. This controller was up there, I'm guessing, by himself. But there was another one that was very interesting. Later on, you have a United plane that has also pushed back, kind of in the similar area to where Delta was. And they're looking for a taxi to the runway, just like Delta, and their final clearance. Anytime you get on an airliner, we fly a type of flying which requires air traffic control on the ground to give us separation from other planes and monitor our aircraft. And one of the ways that they do that is off of this code called a squat code. It's a four digit code that we put in our transponder on the plane. And it's just another way for them to help identify who we are. So this guy, this pilot you're about to hear is asking for his squat code and you're gonna see why this is relevant. Listen to this audio. Speed of Tower United 2083, request taxi, clearance to Houston. Taxi to call the impound runway 36 when you're ready, Tower 1183, mile trade 5. United 2083, taxi to 36, we are on 11835. And uh, via Alpha? Via Alpha, correction, via Hotel Alpha. Hotel Alpha, United 2083. Red Tower for United 2083. Do you have a clearance for us yet? We need a squawk and an altitude. United 2083, confirm are you ready for takeoff? That's affirmative, we will be. United 2083, we're in time one with 34. Very clear for Yeah, we need a squawk and a clearance for departure for United 2083. Okay, there is a lot of things in here, but let's start with the big ones. First thing to know is that Quito Airport has two runways, runway 36 
and runway 18. They are the exact same piece of pavement, but they're going different directions, so they technically count as two runways. But the controller clears them for takeoff on runway 34. You know, to see runway 34, the other thing is that this United plane has pushed back. They were asking for a taxi clearance to the runway and their final clearance for uh, the route of flight. Usually, the controllers are going to give you taxi to the runway holding point 36 via, and they'll give you the different taxiways. You heard the pilot say, you want us to go via Alpha? That's usually not the way it goes. The controller is going to tell you this is the way they want you to get there. The only time that I can ever think of that at a major airport where somebody said just taxi to parking or taxi this way, however you want to go there, was right in the beginning of COVID. I landed in Amsterdam, which is a super busy airport, and we were the only plane out there. And we landed, we came off the runway. It was so eerie. It felt very apocalyptical. But we were taxiing, and we got off the runway, and the controller said, okay, taxi to park however you want to get there. Uh, however however we want to get there to parking like there's multiple runways and taxiways and they said yeah however you want to get there there's no other planes coming here for the next two hours this was like middle of the day so middle of the day taxi to park however you want to get there i will never forget that it was so strange so that is maybe one of the very weird rare circumstances that you're going to get an instruction like that very weird but you will not typically get that to the runway in endless any other situation. And that's why you heard this pilot say, hey, you want us to taxi via Alpha? And then the controller said, hotel in Alpha. And uh, via Alpha? Via Alpha, correction, via Hotel Alpha. Now, earlier I mentioned I'd flown to this airport a lot, and I have, and they're really good controllers. And you need that in a place with very high mountainous terrain, obviously. That is a very high risk, and one of the ways that you mitigate that risk is by having the terrain feature on your screens, but also having air traffic control there, watching your plane and knowing that area better than anybody else. They know the sectors that are going to be dangerous to be in. So you have a very heavy reliance on air traffic control, and as a pilot, you have a lot of scenarios that you might deal with that will be very clear of what to do. One of those scenarios, which I had honestly never really considered, was you're dealing with an air traffic controller that is there by themselves, meaning normally they're working in groups of people. You'll be at least two people up there, so they, they can switch off. But there are times that there is just one person there, like apparently this one. And that one person that's up there is not doing well. And so that is just not a normal situation. There have been cases where a controller has had a stroke and they had a stroke and then there's somebody else that's there that can all of a sudden see or hear or realize something is going wrong and they can jump in and help. But this went on with this controller for several hours that they were up there. So as a pilot, if you're in your plane getting ready to go and then you're having this interaction, it's, it's, it's a weird one. Like, what do you do? Do you call dispatch and say like, hey, uh, this guy sounds off but we're gonna go back to the gate. Like, it's just a very weird circumstance to be in. And that's what made this video so interesting to me because being a pilot is a lot about making good decisions and you have this decision to make. Do you go when you have this controller who's clearly lacking some overall awareness of what's going on and you're trying to get your clearance and they're just clearing you for takeoff on a runway that doesn't exist? Do you go off anyways? Do you wanna just get out of their airspace so you just, take off like what do you do what this united pilot does is is kind of interesting you notice this pilot earlier asked for the clearance but now they're just saying we just need an altitude and a squawk red tower for united 2083 do you have a clearance for us yet we need a squawk and an altitude and that is probably because they already have everything else their clearance would have come through from the airline and said hey you're going to fly this departure and you're going to fly this route over to houston so they have everything they think that they need. And my guess is that they're on this departure here. And as you can see, it doesn't list a top altitude on it. It has these crossing restrictions, which means you have to be above these altitudes on your way out. But typically in that situation, the controller is gonna say, fly this departure up to, let's say, 
flight level 230, so 23,000 feet. That's typically a type of clearance that you would get, and that would let you know, okay, cool, so we'll hit these restrictions on our way up, and then we'll stop at 23,000. So that's something the controller would give you, and the other thing that they would have to give you is that squat code, it's that random four digit code. You can't just guess that. You could take off on this SID, let's just say, there is no controller there. Let's just say you wanted to take off, you're not, you're not allowed to do this, don't do this, but let's just say you wanted to take off and you would say, okay, cool, I'll make these restrictions, 11, 17, whatever, all the restrictions all the way out, that's gonna keep you safe. And then you'll try to get somebody else on a frequency, like you could, let's say, hypothetically do that, but that would be very strange. So you need that squat code and you need that altitude and then you need the verification of your clearance. Those are the things that you need in order to be able to take off and the clearance for takeoff, which he already got for runway 34. But watch what this United pilot does. United to zero entry, wind calm, runway 36, wind takeoff. Sir, I can't take off without a squawk. I need a four digit squawk for departure and a clearance. Scope 1, correction, scope 5541. Squawk 5541, United 2083. Pasco. And we'll be on the uh, Palais 4 for United uh, 2083, squawk 5541. Pasco, Lincoln, runway 36, clear for takeoff. Clear for takeoff, runway 36, United 2083. So I don't know if there was an altitude that was given at some other point, or if this pilot just decided, hey, okay, we need to get out of this dude's airspace. But they're on the ground, so they're not at any risk. They're not, it's not like a, we have to do this. That American pilot earlier, well, they are in a much more challenging situation because they need to land there. So now you have someone that's incapacitated to some degree, and you can make that, that call, say, hey, uh, we decided to land, we decided that was the safest course of action, because otherwise we were gonna need to get a handoff from that controller and to get out, and we didn't feel that it was gonna be safe, and so we landed. Okay, you could make that argument. The United pilot, it'd be a harder argument to make, because you're on the ground, so there's no risk. You could just turn around and go back and park your plane. Not a big deal. Maybe there was an altitude given, I don't really know. My guess is since they have their departure from their clearance is that they're going to dial in 17,000 feet, which is this clearance right here, and they're hoping the next controller will give them a higher altitude. Typically, once you depart, shortly after you get up in the air, the controller will hand you off and give you another frequency for somebody else to talk to, who will be usually in an office or some other location other than the tower. The tower usually has the tower frequency and the ground frequency, and they're physically needing to see and look at things. The, a lot of the other stuff, they're just using radar. So he may be getting up, and once you get off the ground, then you're hoping, okay, this next guy, hopefully he's in a better circumstance, and he can give me a higher clearance, and then you fly. And with the squat code and confirming that this is the, this, the departure they're on, that's what my guess is. Either way, I'm sure these pilots are talking to each other, especially after the controller says something like this. United to see what we in time while we take four, take care of us. I have no idea what was going on with that controller. Drugs, drinking, blood sugar, stroke. I mean, it's a million different things and I'm not a doctor. But I think in this situation, if I ever were to encounter it, probably what I would hope that I would do would be say, is there anybody else up there? You don't sound like you're doing really well. Or if there is nobody else up there, call the dispatcher and then let your dispatcher sort that out. They have a number for, for like everything. Oh, I've talked about them before. They are the people on the ground who the pilots use as like our relay point for everything. On the ground like that, you would just take your company phone out or your regular phone out. You would call your dispatcher and say, hey, uh, we're on the ground here in Quito. This controller doesn't sound like they're doing well. I don't know if there's something wrong medically with them, but I don't feel safe taking off. Your airline is never gonna be upset about you making a decision based off of safety, within reason, right? So in this situation, if they were to listen to the audio, they could, you could be very easily defend yourself. Hey, this, this guy doesn't sound like he's doing really well, so we made our decision that the safest course of action was we need to go back to the gate. You could go back to the gate and then let your dispatcher call somebody, I don't know who they would call, that's their job, and probably send somebody over there to check on this guy and see what's going on. 
United decided, hey, we're, we're, we're just going to blast out of here. And obviously, they made it out okay. They had their squawk code. So I'm sure as soon as they got to their next frequency, they continued as normal. But I have, I have no way to know. But my guess is, through that entire flight, they were talking about that guy and what was going on with them. Kind of crazy. I look forward to hearing from you. Until then, keep the blue side up.